for the generation of Americans who came of age during the 1930s, the name Harry Bridges was virtually synonymous with militant unionism and radical left-wing politics. He remained a prominent public figure uh, through the 1970s. Today, I'm going to give you a very fast overview of what I consider the major events in Bridges' life, and especially his major contributions to the ILWU. Then I'll present what I think of as his legacy, his approach to union leadership, which should be relevant for union members today, and his contributions to civil liberties, which are relevant for all of us. Bridges was born in 1901 in Australia. He was baptized as Alfred Renton Bridges. While a teenager, he began to call himself Harry after his favorite uncle, his father's brother, who advocated trade unionism and the socialism of the Australian Labor Party. He went to sea in 1917 at the age of 16, sailing at first between Melbourne and Tasmania, and later between Australia and New Zealand. In 1920, Bridges came to San Francisco, joined the Sailors Union of the Pacific, and began to work in the U.S. coastal trade. In 1921, he participated in a nationwide seaman strike and briefly enjoyed to join the industrial workers of the world. He later said that the IWW had taught him the importance of solidarity among all workers, regardless of race, ethnicity, or religion. In 1922, he began to work on the San Francisco docks as a longshoreman. Dock work then was harsh and dangerous. Hiring was by the day or the job through the morning shape up. There was no guarantee of continued employment, no benefits, just an hourly wage. A union of sorts called the Blue Book for the color of its dues book was undemocratic, undemocratic, corrupt, and exploitative. In 1933, the International Longshoremen's Association chartered Local 3879 in San Francisco. Bridges emerged as a leader among some two dozen longshoremen, including some Communist Party members, who caucused at a hall on Albion Street. The Communist Party gave them an old mimeograph machine, which they used to run off the waterfront worker, which advocated militant action and opposed racial, ethnic, religious, or political discrimination within the union or on the job. The uh, ILWU archives has a complete set of these, and they are all digitized, and you can look at them online. When the union elected its first officers, Bridges and Henry Schmidt, two of the Albion Hall Caucus, won seats on the executive board. ILA locals from northern Washington to San Diego were part of the ILA's Pacific Coast District. Early in 1934, the district sought a coastwise contract. When waterfront employers refused, a coastwise longshore strike began. Several seafaring unions promptly struck with issues of their own. Much of the strike centered in San Francisco. These were the issues, issues for the longshoremen. And of these demands, the most important were union recognition, a coastwise contract with the same wages, hours, and conditions in every Pacific Coast port, and union hiring halls to replace the hated shakeup. These became the basis later for the ILWU. On May day, on May 8, the day before the strike began, Bridges was elected chairman of his local strike committee. He had no opposition for the post. Bridges quickly became one of the most prominent figures in the strike, along with the other district leaders. On the afternoon of July 3rd, and again on July 5th, 
the Industrial Association of San Francisco, acting for the waterfront employers, tried to open up the port. You heard about it in the song. Using, uh, they opened the port using strike breakers under heavy police protection. Strikers resisted. On July 5th, San Francisco police killed two men and injured more than 100. Earlier, police had killed two strikers in Seattle and two in Los Angeles. Since then, among Pacific Coast longshore workers, July 5th has been known as Bloody Thursday. The governor sent the National Guard to the San Francisco waterfront where they set up machine guns and patrolled the waterfront in tanks to protect the scabs. The San Francisco Labor Council voted a general strike. The general strike began on July 16th and lasted four days, shutting down much of the city uh, in a dramatic demonstration of so labor solidarity. During and shortly after the general strike, all parties agreed to arbitration by a board appointed by President Roosevelt. The longshoremen gained their most important demands, especially a coastwise contract and hiring halls in each port with a dispatcher elected by union members. The strike propelled bridges to the presidency of Local 3879 and then to the presidency of the Pacific Coast District. In mid-1937, the members of the Pacific Coast District voted overwhelmingly to join the Congress of Industrial Organizations, becoming the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union. Bridges became its first president and CIO regional director. Time Magazine put Bridges on its cover and called him the most conspicuous maritime labor leader in the U.S. today and also called him incorruptible. I'm jumping forward rather rapidly. In 1948, the ILWU faced a crisis. The Waterfront Employers Association wanted to regain control over hiring and had support in the Republican Congress, which had just passed the Taft-Hartley Act which was aimed at restricting unions. Some provisions in that act were aimed directly at the ILWU's hiring halls. Federal authorities used the Taft-Hartley Act to require that ILWU members vote on the employer's last offer. Not a single ballot was returned in one of the most impressive demonstrations of union solidarity in all U.S. labor history. Then came a bitter three-month strike, during which the waterfront employers negotiators refused even to meet with Bridges because they accused him of being a communist. Eventually, some of the stockholders in the affected companies brought in a new negotiator, and the two sides quickly came to an agreement. The irony was that the former negotiators had tried to get the ILWU to dump Bridges, but in the end, it was those negotiators who were given early retirements. <laughs> the successful negotiations of 1948 initiated a new look in longshore labor relations as the ILWU and the PMA, the new bargaining agent for the employers, negotiated a series of contracts that gave longshore workers job stability, paid vacations, a pension plan, and one of the first medical plans. By the late 1950s, Bridges, other ILWU officers, and many Longshore members were focused on a new, transformative, and potentially disruptive technology, containerization, the most important development in ocean shipping since the steam engine. The ILWU kept its members fully informed Here's a part of the newspaper of the very first container shipping from the Pacific Coast. Bridges argued that the ILWU should not fight change, but instead try to benefit from it. After extensive discussion in the union newspaper, in union meetings, and with endorsement by the membership, Bridges led negotiations through which the ILWU accepted full mechanization 
in return for generous retirement arrangements and a guarantee of full pay for those who did not retire even if there was no work. The ILWU PMA Modernization and Mechanization Agreement of 1960 led Secretary of Labor James P. Mitchell to judge that next only to John L. Lewis, Bridges has done the best job in American labor of coming to grips with the problems of automation. Bridges retired as ILWU president in 1977. And now I want to look at two aspects of Bridges' time as a union leader. First, the Supreme Court cases that set precedents for civil liberties. Then, Bridges' understanding of union leadership. Bridges' first Supreme Court case was Bridges versus California, which grew out of events in 1938 when Bridges was not yet a citizen. He had publicized a telegram that he sent to the Secretary of Labor about the likely consequence of a state if a state judge ruled against the ILWU in the pending case. The judges found Bridges in contempt of court. Bridges appealed, eventually, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which decided in his favor by five to four, citing freedom of speech. The decision in Bridges versus California was only the second time the Supreme Court had invoked the 14th Amendment as limiting the ability of state governments to infringe on the liberties in the First Amendment. The decision did not mention Bridges' citizenship status, but a dissent noted that Bridges was not a citizen and thereby suggested that the majority opinion had the effect of conferring First Amendment rights on any person living in the United States regardless of citizenship. This decision was the second in a long series of Supreme Court decisions that prevented state and local governments from restricting First Amendment rights. Between 1939 and 1958, 55, sorry, Bridges was involved in four hearings or trials over his right to become and remain a U.S. citizen. They all revolved around the same central question, was Bridges a Communist Party member? Throughout his career as a labor leader, Bridges was open about being a Marxist, open about meeting with communists, open about his admiration for the Soviet Union. What was at issue in all four of these was whether the government could prove that Bridges was a party member. Had the government succeeded in any one of these cases, Bridges would have been denied citizenship, or stripped of his citizenship, and then been subject to either deportation or imprisonment or both. The first hearing officer in 1939 found for Bridges. Soon after, the House of Representatives voted by 330 to 42 for a bill that directed the Attorney General to arrest and deport Bridges quote, notwithstanding any other provision of law, unquote. <laughs> President Roosevelt knew this was unconstitutional but didn't want to have to veto it. So he sent Attorney General Robert Jackson to work out, uh, work with key senators in order to kill the bill in the Senate. At the same time, a new law, the Smith Act, changed the grounds for deportation from Communist Party membership to what was called affiliation a change specifically designed for Bridges. And Jackson ordered the FBI to investigate Bridges. The FBI delivered a massive report, more than 4,000 pages, uh, to Jackson in November of 1940. Jackson appointed Clarence N. Goodwin as a special assi assistant attorney general to review the FBI report. Goodwin was a constitutional law expert. He spent two months studying the FBI report, and you see here his conclusion. There is no direct evidence that the alien was ever a member of the Communist Party. Nonetheless, after a lengthy hearing, a new hearing officer found against Bridges, 
setting off a round of appeals and efforts to mobilize public opinion on Bridges' side. Song for Bridges, which you've just heard, was part of those efforts to mobilize public opinion. The FBI investigation of Bridges did not end when the hearing ended. FBI agents illegally tapped Bridges' phone and broke into the office of one of his lawyers and copied hundreds of documents about his case and other cases pending in federal courts. This is apparently the first known instance when the FBI did this to a lawyer with cases pending in federal courts. The Supreme Court finally heard the appeal in early April 1945. In the decision, the judges divided five to three with one recusal. It was a narrow decision likely to maintain their thin majority, but the conclusion was that Bridges had been ordered deported under a misconstruction of the term affiliation and by reason of an unfair hearing. However, the decision also confirmed that Bridges versus California had established that an alien has First Amendment rights of speech and press. Justice Frank Murphy concurred separately but went far beyond the narrow majority decision, stating, the record in this case will stand forever as a monument to man's inhumanity to man. Seldom, if ever, in the history of this nation has there been such a con concentrated and relentless crusade to deport an individual because he dared to exercise the freedom that belongs to him as a human being and that is guaranteed to him in the Constitution. And in his dissent, Murphy also concluded that the entire Smith Act was unconstitutional as punishing guilt by association. But that was a dissent in 1945. That constitutional issue had been raised by Bridges' attorneys. It was finally taken up by the Supreme Court only in 1957 in Yates versus U.S., which essentially ended Smith Act prosecutions. Bridges was neither a defendant nor a plaintiff in the third civil liberties case, but he was centrally involved. When campaigning for president in 1960, John F. Kennedy announced that what he called an effective attorney general could remove James Hoffa and Harry Bridges from their union offices. Once elected, Kennedy named his brother Robert as his attorney general. However, the Kennedy brothers did not try to remove Bridges. Instead, Robert Kennedy picked an easier target, Archie Brown, an open Communist Party member who had recently been elected to Local 10's executive board, a violation of Section 504 of the Landrum-Griffin Act, which prohibited Communist Party members from holding union office. Kennedy's Justice Department notified Bridges that Brown's election violated Section 504. Bridges responded, quote, the members of Local 10 had the right to elect anybody they damn well pleased, unquote. <laughs> Brown was arrested and indicted. Robert Kennedy told the press that Brown was the first to be charged under Section 504, presumably as a test case. Bridges and the other ILWU officers directed the union's attorneys to represent Brown. They admitted that Brown was violating Section 04, but argued that Section 04 was violating freedom of association. Brown, or Bridges, was the first defense witness. He denounced Section 504 as meaning, quote, we could no longer operate as a democratic union we could no longer elect whom we wanted as officers, unquote. The judge, of course, found Brown guilty. He essentially admitted he was guilty. But on appeal, the full Ninth Court, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, by a five to three vote, uh, agreed that Section 504 was unconstitutional. Kennedy's Justice Department then appealed that ruling, but the US Supreme Court agreed and declared Section 504 unconstitutional as a bill of attainder. Asked for a comment, 
Bridges described the Landrum, the entire landrum griffin Act as, quote, one of the phoniest anti-labor laws slipped over on workers by such enemies of labor as Bobby Kennedy, unquote. Now I want to look at these four aspects of Bridges' approach to union leadership. Bridges was proud of the wages and working conditions that his union had won, but he also believed that a union needed to do more than just deliver good wages. I'm going to try to play for you his definition of what it meant to be the president of a left-wing union, and we'll see if it'll work. That's Bridges' definition of what it meant to be an officer of a left-wing union. In 1953, whoops, there we go. In 1953, Bridges and the other international officers presented the first version of what became the ILWU's 10 guiding principles, an extended definition of the what the union was and still is all about. They are worth reading by any union member or anyone trying to organize a union. If there's one concept that covers all of these principles, it's the solidarity of labor and of working people all over the world, a concept that Bridges constantly preached and practiced. Bridges was very critical of what he called one-man unions, Throughout his presidency, he shared leadership with the elected vice president and the elected secretary treasurer. Within the Longshore Division, which he always headed, he shared leadership with the elected members of the Coast Labor Relations Committee. I came to think of Bridges as a combination of Marxist militant and pragmatic realist. His militancy was important in salvaging victory in 1934. He always said that it was important in bargaining to realize that the employer representatives were what he called the class enemy, even if they might be his personal friends. On the other hand, the M&M is a leading example of Bridges as a pragmatic realist. He once called it, and I'm quoting now, a beautiful piece of class collaboration, unquote. When Bridges died in 1990, one journalist observed, the fusion of leadership with the rank and file was Bridges' genius and his power, unquote. The Longshore Caucus was one way in which Bridges institutionalized this fusion of leadership and membership. Meetings of more than 100 elected delegates from every Longshore local to engage in freewheeling discussions of the contract, their concerns, and their goals. The ILWU also institutionalized large negotiating committees with elected representatives from all the major Longshore locals, and rarely, but nonetheless occasionally, with what were called fishbowl negotiations where the entire Longshore Caucus could observe uh, the procedures and raise concerns separately with the negotiating committee. Bridges always insisted that any settlement had to be approved by a vote of the entire membership and, at times, by a supermajority. This was all part of what he referred to as 
a lot of rank and file democracy. Now, I should emphasize that these are my conclusions based on my research, but not everyone would agree, and perhaps not even Harry himself. He once said that college professors, people like me, are not qualified to write about labor history, and that anyone who writes real labor history must be, in his words, a working stiff. He further explained that a college professor is unable to understand, and I quote, quoting again, there's no two sides. There's only one side, our side. The boss is always wrong. You can't sell a college professor on that. <laughs> In 1985, the ILWU convention adopted a resolution by a unanimous standing vote and with long and sustained applause that called Bridges, quote, a living legend and an active symbol of what has always been great about the ILWU, an independent, militant, rank and file democratic union, unquote. At about the same time, a national survey put only two San Franciscans on a list of the most prominent Americans of the 20th century. One was A.P. Giannini of the Bank of America, the other was Harry Bridges. Memorials and monuments to Bridges continue to appear. I'll give you a minute. It's a long, long list. I'm not going to read it to you. Just take my word for it. <laughs> But the most obvious monument to Bridges is the ILWU itself, which continues to stand on the left of the US labor movement and continues to be highly democratic. And do we have time if people want to ask questions or make comments? Yeah, I think we have a We do. Chance. Sure, I'm happy to take any questions. FBI knew it was forged, uh, but the FBI's report on it was not made public. Uh, and it kept coming up in HUAC meetings for years and years and years. Anytime Harry's name came up, they produced the forged card. Uh, I did do research. I spent several months in Moscow uh, going through an archive there that holds the records of the US Communist Party. Uh, and my conclusion was that Bridges' relation to the Communist Party was sometimes rather ambiguous. But what was absolutely clear in all of those records was that nobody from the party ever gave him an order. They sometimes gave him a request. <laughs> and sometimes he did, and more often he just did what he thought was best for his union. Could you speak a little bit about uh, the FBI and Jay Hoover, how, how he was involved? Yeah, well, Hoover, of course, was very personally involved in the Bridges case from the beginning. Uh, at the point at which uh, the FBI was given this, this charge in, in 1941. Uh, Hoover liked to really bask in the publicity he got from being personally involved uh, in, in big headline cases. So he personally flew out to San Francisco to announce that he was taking charge, big splash in the newspapers, and then he went back to Washington and turned it all over to one of his assistants. <coughs> Um, but, but he followed it all very carefully. You know, all through Bridges' FBI file, you'll come across little notes scribbled in the margin by, by Hoover. 
he was watching it all very carefully. And on one occasion, uh, uh, shortly after that, that first decision, while it was all, or the second decision, while it was being appealed, Bridges was in New York for, for a fairly long period of time, uh, holding various kinds of meetings with his defense committee and, and other CIO uh, organizations. And the FBI bugged his hotel room. And he found the bug. But instead of just uh, disconnecting it, uh, he uh, took a hotel room directly across the street where he could look into the hotel room that the FBI had. They had the hotel room next to him <laughs> where they had a recording machine and, and so forth. And so he brought in some newspaper reporters. He brought in Vito Marcantonio, who was a member of Congress in New York. Um, and then they announced all of this. But uh, before they made their announcement, the FBI figured out that they'd been spotted. And they, they cleared out the room. Uh, and all that, that could be found in, left in the room was a carbon copy of a report uh, that had an FBI agent's name at the bottom of, of, the, of it. So, so they did have, have that. But even that was snatched away by the uh, hotel manager who said, oh, we have to turn this back over to the people who were in this room. Um, yeah. And one final comment about all that. It was written up in the New Yorker. It was called Some Fun with the FBI. <laughs> and Hoover was furious. Uh, someone later said that, that Hoover never got over his anger about having been held up to ridicule because when that story hit, Hoover met with Roosevelt and Roosevelt, President Roosevelt just kind of laughed at him and said, well, you, well, John, you got caught with your pants down this time. <laughs> Don't get your panties in a knot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Hoover, it was also said that there were many agents who rose or fell based upon the Bridges case because Hoover was so directly connected to it. Yeah, question in the back. Can you uh, discuss uh, Bridges' leadership and legacy around fair employment, opening up the union to black workers and other workers of color, please? Yes, you know, I, I, I do look at all of that in the book. Uh, from the very beginning, Bridges argued that there could be no discrimination on the job or in the union. And during the 1934 strike, uh, there was a sustained effort, especially by Bridges, to bring this message to the black community in the Bay Area. Because in the previous big longshore strike in 1919, uh, blacks had been used as strike breakers. And that was a strategy that employers used at the time. If you go on strike, we're going to turn your job over. And they didn't use polite language, right? Um, there were a very small number of black gangs on the waterfront, but they were segregated, segregated black gangs. One of the things that Bridges and his, his uh, associates in the Albion Hall Caucus did, as soon as they were on the executive board, uh, and, and as soon as Bridges was president, was to make sure that there would be no more segregation of work gangs on the San Francisco waterfront. Uh, and throughout his career, Bridges worked also to bring black members into leadership. Uh, and it was partly through his doing that the first of the international, the first black international officer uh, became a vice president. So Bridges uh, was committed to racial equality throughout his entire time, uh, and, and he worked very hard to make sure that the union was open without any kind of racial, religious, political discrimination. Thank you. All the way in the back. Yeah, throughout his time as, as international president, he insisted that his pay be no higher than that of the best paid longshore worker. Um, and at that time, I don't know if this is still true, but at that time, 
the president's pay was set by the, by the uh, annual convention or the, the international convention when it became biannual and later triannual. I don't know how the president's pay is set now. But it was always a subject for discussion because there would be efforts to give him more money and he would insist that he not be paid any more than the best paid longshore worker. People pointed out, you know, there are walking bosses who make more than that, but he, he uh, simply refused. Uh, here, and, th and then I'll take it over here. Uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of relationship, uh, if any, did uh, he have with the other uh, leadership of the uh, other CIO unions, uh, uh, Murray, Ruther, uh, Thomas? Um, it became very strained. Um, especially in the uh, after World War II, uh, during the McCarthy era, um, the, the leadership of the CIO became anti-communist. Uh, Bridges kept his own politics, uh, and relations were very strained. However, that 1948 strike came at a time when Bridges' relations with the CIO leadership were probably as strained as they had ever been. And that's probably one of the reasons why the Waterfront Employers Association thought, now's the time. Now's the time. We're going to get the union to dump Bridges, and the CIO isn't going to come to his assistance. Uh, they were absolutely wrong, because the CIO was there and fully supportive of the strike sat at the bargaining table with Bridges, uh, demonstrated their, their full commitment to him and to the union. Uh, and then shortly after that, they expelled the ILWU, <laughs> as you probably are well aware. There was a hand over here. Did anyone more? Hi, uh, uh, I'm a former student of Bob's, and I, and I followed Bob to Moscow, in fact, uh, where he gave me some assistance for my own research into uh, Communist Party archives, which was all of my, uh, much of all my dissertation. I just want to say one or two more words about uh, Harry Bridges. Now, the tri criterion for Communist Party membership set by Lenin in the year 1902 uh, was that to be a member of a Communist Party, you had to be a member of an organization, follow its discipline. And I think later they had the idea that you also had, uh, had to pay dues. Uh, well, he certainly, uh, Bridges certainly did, never did any one of these things. And I believe there's a quote from Bridges, which Bob, maybe you confirm, that supposedly he said at one point that I don't follow the, uh, I, the Communist Party doesn't tell me what to do, I tell them what to do. And, uh, and in fact, I believe he did sit in on, in on some uh, high level Communist Party meetings where he told them what to do, uh, but, not, but not, did not necessarily uh, do what they told him, is my understanding. Basically right, John. I, I did not come across that exact quotation, but I say something pretty much like that myself in the book that uh, there are times when Bridges took positions that were contrary to the position of the Communist Party, and that sometime reasonably soon afterwards they changed their mind and followed his lead rather than him uh, following what the party uh, line of the moment was. Um, yeah, I, except that I never found that quotation. You're right, John. It's always good to see my former students here. I think that John may be the only one. Usually there's more in these gatherings. Okay, Who's we're that? Gonna, we're gonna wrap Joe Oh, Joe. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, my. Joe in the back? Yeah, Joe had a question. All the way in the back. Sure, go ahead. No. Question, go ahead. Oh. You know, you, you begin to feel old when you discover that some of your former students are retiring. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can talk about his uh, fight uh, to defend Japanese Americans and his wife. Yeah. Um, the, uh, in case you didn't hear the question, it was, you know, what was his uh, position at the time of the Japanese uh, so-called relocation, the, in the incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, in, in, the, in 1942. Um, there was a meeting of the international officers, and they decided that uh, Bridges at the time 
uh, was in all kinds of legal jeopardy. You, you saw all of those trials. And so they decided that Lou Goldblatt would be the one to make this statement on behalf not only of the ILWU but the California CIO. And the statement was that this is wrong, that this is being conducted, this, this is a decision being made in a moment of hysteria and it will be uh, marked that way in history and uh, you shouldn't do it. And throughout uh, the war, the uh, ILWU dispatcher consistently had articles about Japanese Americans uh, who were uh, supporting the war effort, who, you know, who were in the army, uh, who were engaged in, in various kinds of war work. And at the end of that war, uh, after the Japanese uh, were released from the camps and began returning to work, uh, the ILWU made a point of being open to them as members. There is a famous case which Harvey has written. Is, where's Harvey Schwartz? There you are. Which Harvey has written about in Stockton, um, a part of Local 6, one of the, uh, a warehouse unit in Stockton, had barred a Japanese American from membership. And Harry and uh, the head of Local 6 went to Stockton and ripped their charter off the wall and required that every member of that local had to sign a statement pledging that they were opposed to any such racial discrimination and refusal to sign meant that you were out of the union. Read Harvey's article about it. He has a lot more information than I have in my book. Thanks, Harvey.